This is how long my procedurally generated game used to take to generate a world. And this is how long it takes now. My preliminary tests show that there's an improvement of about 266 times compared to what it used to be. It's a massive step up and it also happened to solve a lot of technological issues that I've been dealing with for quite a while. So how did I actually manage to do this? Previously the game was implemented in a scripting language called Squirrel, which is really great for doing gameplay things, but not really great at all for doing processor intense stuff like map generation. So this month I decided that the problem had got bad enough that I had no choice but to move all of the map gen logic over to good old C++. And as a result, it's now threaded, implemented with this dynamic plugin system I wrote, and the results kind of speak for themselves. I'm using my own game engine to make this, and it's all taking place as part of a larger project to make a game over the course of 10 years all right on this channel. The more projects I make with it, the better the engine becomes, and then each subsequent project can also benefit from those changes I make to it further down the line. Now one feature I was completely missing was the ability to get custom C++ into an engine project. One of the main design goals of the engine was to be completely data driven. It's a bit like how an old school game console would take a cartridge, which contained the actual game itself, but there was no way to change what the actual game's console operating system did. You actually can load native code on the fly, that's what DLL files do on Windows. They're just like a super badly written code ready to be inserted into an executable file at any given time. Ogre3D, which is a library I'm using as part of this project, also has a very similar plugin architecture. So I just stole it. I started this month by testing to see if this theory held up under scrutiny and magically it did. I was able to build a simple CMake build system which was able to compile a few different libraries together, one of which happened to be a module which could be loaded in at runtime. Actually getting it to be properly dynamic though involved an hour searching for a single line change. See this looks pretty promising but the difficult bit was that it took Google a long time to actually find me the relevant Stack Overflow thing. Like as soon as you go in there and you're like, um, oh, a linking issue with, uh, as soon as it sees linking issue in the text it's just like, oh here's the most basic Stack Overflow response from someone who's never written any C code before. But, you know, this is a fairly specialist job. Oh, anyway, I don't care. This is all just related to the linker. It's some weird C++ stuff. You don't probably need to know about it. Right, let's move on. So now my custom dynamic C++ code was built and I had proven that I could load it dynamically with any random engine binary. I then just needed to airdrop some code into the engine to make sure that the plugin architecture was actually nice. So this included things like being able to specify which plugins to load as part of your setup file. The first thing the plugin tries to do is register this game core namespace which allows the scripts to be able to talk to any of the native C++ code that I actually intend to write. So rather than map generation being implemented entirely in scripts, I would instead just say game core dot begin map gen and it would go off and start making the map for me. And the reason it's called begin map gen and not just like generate map or something like that is because now it's all properly threaded, which is amazing and I've needed that for a long time. With the basic skeleton in place, the first thing that got converted over was mini map generation. It was a bit of a gradual process to get it all working as it did before, but my preliminary testing results showed that it was about 100 times faster compared to what the previous one was, which was fantastic. The next major performance domino to fall was the terrain voxelizer. You might remember from a previous devlog that I managed to get it about 12 times faster by just improving the algorithm and keeping all stern scripts. This time all I was really doing was just converting the code over to C++ and letting the compiler do all the hard work for me. It took a while to get the whole thing properly converted over and I had to deal with a bunch of weird issues like this one or this one, but eventually I managed to get it moved over. And boys, the improvement for this one was super duper delicious, coming in with an improvement of 84 times. And that is worth pointing out that that is for the exact same algorithm running concurrently on a single thread. I think I could realistically get it, you know, probably to be expected about four times faster if I was to start splitting off some of the individual terrain voxelizations off into individual threads, but that's for later. Now then, in preparation for the big boy, which I also refer to as converting the entire map generation code over to C++, what I first did was update my world inspector tool to be aware of the new system. The idea would be that I could convert the steps of the world gen gradually and use the tool to make sure the output was as expected. The map gen itself was split into this master class which housed all of the map gen steps and just called them one by one. This did actually take way longer than I thought it would. I was hoping to have it done in the space of about a week, but you know, RIP, you can't have everything. There was this one issue that stumped me for quite a while though, which related to flood fill. It started with issues generally existing in the code base, which also happened to make no sense whatsoever. I would get bad access errors for simple jobs like pushing to a vector. This freaked me out because that implies that I was corrupting memory somewhere. 
and I ended up spending ages going through the code base to figure out where on earth that might be. Unable to find the cause, I went as far as using a memory inspector tool which unfortunately told me nothing. This genuinely confused and spooked me for a good few days and I do admit I cried a little bit. But eventually I came up with a new theory of what might actually be causing this to happen. My stack had got too big. So I'd actually implemented my flood fill recursively. So what that means is that the function essentially pulls itself from within itself. Um, and it uses the stack to keep track of where it's actually been. This had worked fine in Squirrel, but now in C++ it was complaining. I ended up proving this theory by just setting it up with a really small world and observing that it worked reliably each time with no memory corruption. For whatever reason, Xcode and Clang were just reporting this as a bad access error, which was not what it was at all. It was just a good old fashioned stack overflow. And after a little bit of searching, I came across this very morbid stack overflow post. Terminology is unrelated, by the way. Even a moderate sized flood fill will blow your stack. I'd never even considered that this might have been the problem, but only really because the previous implementation just worked fine in Squirrel. On closer inspection, Squirrel will actually just expand the stack as it needs to meaning that any crimes committed as part of the expansion will just be lost to history. And it was a complete red herring. So actually, my flood fill implementation was ridiculously memory inefficient from the very beginning, which might explain a few things. It was actually a pretty simple job to convert over to a different approach. The algorithm now just pushes to an STD stack, which contains the information about which coordinates to consider next and the whole thing works wonderfully. That was probably the biggest stick in the mud for the entire thing. The rest of it was just converting code from Squirrel to C++. Gradually things started to fall back into place and the performance improvements could be seen in how much larger worlds the game could generate. The final interesting thing I want to mention, one problem I had was that I had to duplicate values like constants across the two programming languages. Both programming languages needed to make use of enums such as this one, but how do I make them aware of these enums without like actually duplicating them in the code base. The only real option at the time seemed to be using C++ to like inject them into Squirrel, but this was still not really ideal and I just felt the whole thing was kind of gross. However, I then had a brainwave. Would it be possible to make the same file valid in both programming languages? That way I wouldn't have to duplicate the values at all, they'd live in the same place. This realization stemmed from me remembering a quirk of the Squirrel programming language, which is that there are two ways to define a comment. There's the regular double slash method, and there's also a hash, like what you do in something like Python. Both of these things are considered comments, but in C++, the hash is used for preprocessor definitions, which you can use to do all sorts of black magic that you're not really meant to talk about, but you can do them anyway. So in theory, I'd be able to set up a bunch of lines of code that would be completely ignored by Squirrel, but still used by C++. And that way I could get around any of the nuances with the languages themselves. I gave this idea a quick little test and it worked magically. And this completely opened the floodgates for me, shifting all of the constants used as part of the project into this universal C++ and Squirrel file type. Now I won't deny the fact that I had to invent a bunch of weird workarounds while I was there, notably this one or this one, or probably this one as well. There was quite a few of them. <laughs> And with that, I ended up with a constant defined in one single place only. Now, if you don't know anything about programming, you might think that that's not very important. But if you do know about programming, you'll know that long term, it gets really annoying to have values duplicated in other places. It leads to all sorts of dumb issues. So this is fantastic. It did take a little while for me to figure out how to get some of it working properly, but I was very happy with how it worked by the time I was done with it. I actually built a static plugin loading method as well for those platforms that don't support dynamic plugins, which is mostly iOS. I set up this system with a header file, which contains a list of which static plugins to load. And this is actually just run as part of regular C++ code as well. Now, as far as porting to other platforms went, Linux worked quite well. Windows didn't really work very well. Both Linux and Apple platforms provide you with a flag that allows you to essentially defer the linking stage until later on, because of course, this is a dynamic plugin that's gonna be used as part of something else. Now on Windows, I just simply couldn't find an equivalent flag for the compiler. It just seemed to not exist. I didn't really see why the reason for that would be, but there just didn't seem to be a way to defer the linking stage, which was quite annoying. So it meant that in Windows, a special case I had to make was that when you build the engine, I also artifact the avcore lib file, which is the thing that contains like the main engine juice <laughs> inside of it. Um, and then the GitHub Actions can just download that at a later step and just link with it. So as much as it's extra work to do, and it'd be more annoying if you're trying to build the plugin on a local PC like a Windows PC. In the cloud, it works perfectly fine. And, you know, it was a valid solution. So it's 
it's just super annoying. Windows, Linux, Mac OS all work perfectly fine with the new plugin architecture, all reading the plugins dynamically, and the platforms that didn't support dynamic plugins would just use the static system. So it all fit wonderfully and worked fine as I expected. Now, speaking of GitHub Actions, do you remember last month when I made a very concerning statement about the current state of the unit test? Well, I actually managed to fix them. I know, right? Celebration time. Who'd have thought? I didn't really think it would work, but I mean, you know, it just, it just, it just somehow managed to work. Yeah, everything is green tick land from now on. Let's see how long it takes me to break it <coughs> from here. But right now, it all works perfectly fine. I don't really want to say that the goblin foot issue has been fixed yet because I just don't know what caused it in the first place, but it's looking good so far. And I also improved the test a little bit by being able to shift some of the other work out, which again is great because I plan to use this testing framework for basically every project I write with this engine. So I want it to be good. Other things I did this month, I also fixed some controller drift issues with the controller implementation. This is all related to dead zones. But speaking of dead in the zone, Oh, oh no! <laughs> Why? Why are you doing this? Don't walk off the world, you idiot. You're not meant to walk off the world. This wasn't supposed to take this long! But I've now got the ability to specify dead zone values for controllers in the engine, which is great when I have some sort of settings menu, which, you know, I kind of need to go on and make a settings menu. Now, one other thing, there was a massive performance difference I found between debug and release builds of the engine. Now, I think this is relating to the way that I built Ogre 3D in debug mode, because it's probably doing lots of validation checks all over the place, um, but that massively slowed it down. And I only really found that out because now I'm able to generate like really large worlds. There's obviously a lot more vertices on the screen, and the frame rate just hit that ceiling way quicker, which of course didn't really make any sense. So because of that, I've updated all the actions on GitHub to release debug and release builds of the engine and also the project itself. And speaking of which, Alpha 0.5.0, which contains all of these speed improvements, can now be downloaded from the GitHub releases page, which is linked down in the description really. So that's the end of the video. My plan for next month is mostly this stuff. So what I want to focus on is improvements to visited locations, which is those places that you can go and look at from the overworld. I haven't touched them in a while and they're due an update. I'm just going to read this all out to you because I don't think I'd actually be able to memorize it. So the plan for next month is firstly improvements to visited places so that you can actually use them as part of the gameplay. There are still crashes on some devices, which is a bit painful. The next thing is improvements to the editor tool because that was the thing that was going to allow me to actually design good locations. Uh, again, making your own engine, you have to kind of do a lot of this stuff from scratch, which is fine, is what I signed up for. And finally, I want to try and get ambient occlusion working for models, which is just all models blanket throughout the system. This is an improvement to the Python script um, because currently they don't have any ambient occlusion whatsoever and things like the houses and visited locations just kind of look like big stupid blobs and it kind of ruins the mood, I think. The thing is that there's a big chunky amount of work that's now been unlocked by the fact that I can have native C++ code within the engine because I can do all different things to talk to Ogre, which will allow me to update like the mesh format and this sort of thing. It should also give massive size improvement to the meshes themselves if I can get it working as I hope I can. But of course we'll have to see. I have left the list kind of short because especially after this month where I thought that I was going to get way more done, I thought I could get it all done in a week. Turns out I can't. So I'm just being a little bit low key and if I do have the time then it will give me an option to fix a lot of the issues that do still exist. So with proper architecture for native code in the engine, the groundwork has been laid for lots of things to come and I hope you're as excited as I am.